Well, greetings, everyone. I'm David Arendelle, and I'm here to talk to you about some things that I've learned over the past couple of decades with trying to sort through all the different intervention programs, academic enrichment programs, different kinds of peer-assisted learning programs that are out there. How do you make decisions about which one to select and to work with? One of the challenges is that oftentimes the fine print is difficult to find that really tells us about what are the specific things that we've got to do in order to be able to implement something. So as you can see, my contact information here, let's go ahead and take a couple of minutes and share some things that I've learned over the years. I've had a chance to implement academic intervention programs and learning centers and student service offices and on a campus-wide basis as well as within an academic department. I have a lot of experience with that. For me, for over 40 years, primarily my experience has been with academic learning centers and with peer-assisted learning programs, but also I've worked with campus-wide systems. In fact, some of the systems that I've worked with that I helped to co-develop have been recognized on a national basis. The Noel Levitz organization has an annual competition each year for outstanding programs that help to increase student academic success and persistence, and it has been my privilege to be on the teams that helped to develop three of those. So I'm trying to share some lessons that I've learned along the way. Whenever you talk about implementing something on campus, I think that there's about eight different things that end up occurring. First of all, we end up identifying, well, what are the problem? And actually, as you notice, we've got a S there. What are the problems that are causing challenges for students? And oftentimes the challenges are different for different groups of students then. And then once you end up identifying what the challenge is, then you start looking at, well, what are all the potential interventions? And boy, there's no end to commercial companies providing services, many of which are really quite good and robust and helpful. Also, you have interventions that are being developed by individual college campuses that will give away the information about those. So once you end up identifying what the challenge is and then sorting through those potential interventions, then you also have to figure out, well, do I really have the kinds of resources needed in order to be able to implement it? And in terms of what kinds of resources, well, you need to understand your campus. Is this particular intervention really going to fit? Some interventions require lots of faculty involvement. Well, sometimes faculty have other priorities. They have. I just retired as a faculty member over the past 40 years. And for me, I had responsibility for publications, winning grants, research publications, teaching classes, advising. I had a full load, more than a full load, not complaining about any of it. But, you know, sometimes it's difficult to find more time in order to be able to do more things. And sometimes some interventions, they just don't really fit with what the campus environment is requiring of the other people. So some intervention programs really are not a good one. Now, one of the things that's been going on for the past couple of decades, which I think has been really positive, and that is college campuses are making more changes to adapt and be more inclusive for new students those that are historically underrepresented. And you can end up talking about that in different ways. First generation students, students of different ethnic backgrounds, recent immigrants to the United States and all the rest. And I think that that's been a really healthy thing that's been going on in the past couple of decades is this issue about inclusion. And how is it that the institution needs to make the change Whenever I started off school four decades ago, the expectation was, here's the university. Now you change and modify your behaviors, your attitudes to fit in. And it's good to know that more enlightened administrators and boards of trustees and faculty and staff and the rest, they're seeing that that's not the way that we ought to be approaching our future students. We need to be the ones that are making changes. 
So we need to go ahead and implement a intervention that we have selected on the basis of our research that occurred up on this side. And then we need to evaluate, well, is this thing really working for us? Just because an intervention program works on one campus, one place, doesn't mean it's always going to work every place else. And this needs to be something that is continual. We end up making modifications, making the thing customized for the particular needs, resources, customs, culture of a particular campus. And then that brings us back to the beginning of the circle again, and we just continue and continue. And then at some point, you may need to go and change the intervention program because you need something that's different then. What I want to talk about is how can we ask the right questions so that we know before we start whether or not we really have selected the appropriate intervention. This is kind of a simplified version of the previous slide. Do we really have the resources and the drive and the ability? I mean, from my point of view, the most expensive resource it takes to implement an intervention is not just simply money. That would seem intuitive. The issue really comes down to oftentimes it's time. Too often, I have seen over the past 30 years, people who are really good at their jobs are given additional work to do, new initiatives, new grant pilot programs, and suddenly you just simply keep stacking on and on more and more responsibilities onto people, and that ends up causing incredible stress, burnout, people leaving the institution, quality of the programs begin to drop. And that's really sad because those individuals are hard workers, but you've got to give them the things they need, and that's going to be time. Whenever I was a supervisor at one of my universities, and one of the things I did with them was I had very detailed job descriptions with all my staff members, and we would end up doing our appraisals, and we'd be talking at intervals throughout the academic term, so we just didn't wait to the end of the year. And one of the things that we would talk about would be if there was something new that I would like to have them help out with, we would look at the job description and figure out well, what can we give up. There's only so much time that can go around. Well, once again, what's the institutional climate like? What's our student needs? And once again, once we end up looking at these four different areas and we have some answers, well, then we can end up selecting the right match. We're not talking about right and wrong. We're talking about what fits a particular campus, their particular amount of resources, and their climate. Being a good consumer, I won't say too much more uh, other than the PowerPoint slides that are located here. I think one of the best ways to be a great consumer is actually go to a college and see the academic intervention in operation. That could be an advising program, could be a new student orientation, it could be um, a learning assistance model that's operating in a learning center, it could be a tutoring program, or it could be a comprehensive peer-assisted learning model, like supplemental instruction, for example. The best thing you can do is you can do all of the reading, you can listen to them present at the conferences, but actually seeing it in operation, you know, these things are going to, over a period of time, can make the difference of a million dollars in revenue by increasing student retention rates. Why don't we go ahead and spend a little bit more money on the front end and maybe spend $2,000 in order to spend some time at another college campus. Consult with that people in charge of that intervention program because they need to be compensated for the time they're going to spend with you and get some training. That's small dollars on what it is that you can invest in order to be able to see that return occur. So I just kind of humorously picked up here with Doritos. You know, they always say we ought to look at the, um, 
the ingredient list, see how nutritious it is, and then to look at the fine print of actually what's inside of a Doritos. I happen to find Doritos to be a wonderful snack food, by the way. And you start understanding, it's a little scary sometimes when you see all of the different products that all go in in order to make it delicious. Well, the idea here is that we need to understand the fine print. That's the reason why I ended up including this here. And that's what these five questions that I'm suggesting that we need to know. How likely is it that this thing is going to work? Do we really have some objective information that tells us? What is it that the institution is going to do? And then what is it that the faculty member is going to need to do? What kind of qualifications and training do we need for the direct service provider? That could be the academic advisor. That could be the student paraprofessional who's running the student uh, study groups. Could be the tutors. Whatever that is, that's the person who directly is having contact with the students. And also, what is the financial investment level. That's the reason why I choose the word investment rather than just simply saying cost. So I'll say more about that in a few moments then. Well, how likely is it that something is going to work? You know, we can hear great presentations at conferences and we can read an article and then make assumptions that obviously it must be pretty good. And I'm pretty optimistic. I think a lot of those people who make presentations uh, are honest and they're telling this stuff. I have done hundreds of presentations at college, or excuse me, at conferences about different programs. But these are the kinds of things that I want to look for if I want to have higher confidence that this thing's going to actually work. What kind of educational theory does it have? What previously validated practices is this thing based on? There's really nothing new under the sun. I think that comes out of some religious book somewhere. Well, that's the same thing that's true also in education. Everything is incrementally grown. What is the previous things that work that you've created something new? Well, what kinds of rigorous evaluation studies have been done? Have they repeated those rigorous evaluation studies? Has it been evaluated by any external agencies? Here's a really big one. Is this thing actually been operating on any other college campuses? You know, there's some programs that work through charisma and the power of the person and what they're able to bring to the situation that really attracts and helps to motivate students. Well, that's wonderful. But you can't always just replicate people. You can replicate programs, but not people. And also, what additional resources are going to be available to help? It's the reason why I want to adopt things to where I can get some additional training. Maybe it's through webinars. Maybe it's through a formal training workshop. I used to work with supplemental instruction programs, and we actually spent three days in an intensive training workshop with a manual that was probably 100 pages long. Why is it that we would take that much time? Because we knew from experience, I mean, SI is now being used at least in 33 different countries in 1,500 colleges. Why has it been successful? Well, we've done the research studies, and actually, frankly, it goes into my dissertation study where I studied every SI program in the United States. And one of the key factors for successful SI programs was the issue about training. How well are you training your supervisor? Have they been trained by a formal training agency like the International Center for SI? Results are higher whenever that happens. How much training are you providing for the study group leaders? And actually, we found it took two days of training plus periodic training uh, sessions throughout the academic term and observation and coaching and all the rest why do we do all of that? We've all got busy lives. We have all kinds of other responsibilities. Because we knew if you didn't do those kinds of investments in training, the results were not going to be as good. Well, what is it that the institutions has to do? Well, it all depends on the intervention program. It's somewhere in this continuum going from the top down to the bottom. Sometimes, well, there's not much of anything that the institution has to do. It's something that operates within a particular course 
or one particular student service unit. It doesn't require a lot of involvement from other people. However, as you go down through the list here, well, sometimes it requires more systematic evaluation studies. It's going to take more people to help out. It's going to have course placement, so that's going to end up having an impact with policies, academic advisors, and other people. And also, how much political will, as well as sufficient resources, are going to be needed by the institution to invest. And that's the reason why it's a key word. Investment, not just simply talking about cost. Well, what is it that the faculty member needs to do? This oftentimes is well too overlooked. Sometimes they don't need to do anything. A drop-in tutoring center doesn't require the faculty member to do much of anything. Students are going to find the tutoring center. Now, it works an awful lot more if their faculty member is mildly interested and makes referrals. Now, that's going to be better for the students in order to encourage them to take advantage of the tutoring program. But some intervention programs, well, it's going to take moderate or extensive time or as it is occurring more often with some academic intervention programs, they've been integrated into the course. And that would be probably underneath the term course redesign. Let's not make the students go somewhere else on campus to get help. Let's go ahead and embed the change within the course. Well, what kind of skill level does the direct uh, service provider need? For the most part, these are your student employees. Maybe they don't need any particular skill level uh, in order to do the job. Generally, most of them are at the undergraduate or the graduate level, and a few intervention programs, well, it requires uh, faculty and staff in order to be able to run it. So once again, you've got another continuing line going from the top down to the bottom. We need to understand and ask these questions before you go and implement the program. And then once again, what kinds of financial investment level? And you go from the top to the bottom again, and it's everything from not much of any money is needed to a lot of money is needed. I learned a lesson whenever we were working at the University of Missouri, Kansas City with an academic support program to help inner city kids uh, to graduate from high school. We'll go into the whole story. It was a pretty remarkable thing. The school district had gone through a lot of turmoil. At one point, they had, I think, seven different uh, superintendents within a period of 10 years. Is that enough turmoil for you? Well, anyway, it was such a mess that the court system actually took over control of the school district. And as you can imagine, with eight superintendents over 10 years, it's kind of hard to um, see some of the follow through and make positive changes happen. Anyway, I happened to be in a meeting with the judge who was in charge of the Kansas City, Missouri Public School District. And the program we were working with, won't we'll go into all the detail to it, it was pretty expensive. There was a lot of cost there. And we kind of felt a little chagrined about the budget that we were presenting to the judge in order for what we said this program was needing. And he kind of scolded us. Kind of, we kind of took us back. It was, it was really helpful because he said we were making the wrong focus. Instead of focusing on what the money was, we need to focus on what were the outcomes that we had to have. And once you establish your outcomes that you've got to have, then you figure out, well, what resources are needed in order to purchase those outcomes. You know, if you want to make a difference with first-generation students, what kinds of investments are you going to make? If you want to be able to have a different demographic of students graduating, well, what are we going to do in order to make sure that historically underrepresented students are graduating at the same rate as they're being admitted into the institution? 
One of the things that I learned over in the United Kingdom, they evaluate institutions not only for do you have a diverse student body who's being enrolled, they want to match up is the demographics of the students who are being admitted, is it basically equal to the students who are graduating? And if they don't match up, there is a financial penalty for the institution. Boy, that's taking things really seriously in terms of are you making a difference with the graduates? That's not something that we typically do here in the United States, but that was a lesson learned from that judge about thinking about investments rather than just costs. And that's basically a summary of what this slide here is really talking about. I, kind of, I guess I could have moved that story from the previous slide to this one here. What outcome at what level is worth the necessary investment? So these are the kinds of questions that would be really helpful for you to think about before you go and select a particular learning assistance program. Or there would be different kinds of peer learning programs. They're very different from one another. They have lots of common elements. If you end up going to the YouTube site that I maintain for peer-assisted learning, you'll end up uh, seeing those differences. There's a couple of articles that I've written uh, in the past couple of decades you might find helpful if this discussion over these last couple of minutes was helpful. The titles look pretty similar to each other, but actually the articles have a different kind of emphasis that is spent inside of them. So I would highly recommend them. And as you can see, uh, both of them end up having web links so you can be able to download the articles or watch them online. There is a, if your interest is peer-assisted learning, once again, the context for this particular video is for any kind of academic intervention, but the one that I know the most about is uh, peer collaborative learning programs like the ones that are named here. There's seven of them, which I pay a lot of attention to. Well, if you'd like to be able to see 1,550 plus publications, research studies about these programs. You can learn more about them. You can see the evidence that supports them. And there's a reason why these are on the page. It's because they do have the evidence. They have been replicated in other places. That's the reason why I have high confidence in their efficacy for helping students to get higher grades, persist longer, and oftentimes to develop personally and professionally. So here's the web link for that, z.umn.edu slash peerbib. And then also you can go to palgroups.org. And then as we go to the final page here, here's another set of websites that you can go to that I maintain, which provides much more information about how to evaluate peer-assisted learning and help you in navigating this incredibly rich, but also rather challenging set of information to figure out, well, where is the best place to go? My contact information is down here on the bottom of the slide. I'd be more than happy to talk with you on the phone. That's my personal cell phone. Uh, send me an email. Here's my personal website. I would love to keep up the conversation with you. I love this different area. Uh, I've now retired out. Now I get a chance to share more lessons that I've learned from other people uh, in different kinds of ways. Uh, thanks for listening today. I hope my words have been useful for your work in helping students to achieve their dreams. Best wishes to you.